Welcome to the Putting the Public into Health podcast by Dr. Richard Pan. As we face one of the greatest public health disasters in a century, this podcast will address questions and issues from you, the public, about the COVID-19 pandemic and its impact on people's health and lives. I am Dr. Richard Pan. I'm a physician with a background in public health, and I'm proud to represent the people of Sacramento, Elk Grove, West Sacramento, and parts of Sacramento County in the California State Senate. I want to share with you important information and stories to help each other during this difficult time. We cannot return to life before the COVID-19 pandemic until there's an effective treatment or a vaccine to prevent the infection. And I'm very excited and honored to have one of our nation's leading scientists join me, Dr. Peter Hotez. Dr. Hotez is Dean of the National School of Tropical Medicine and Professor of Pediatrics and Molecular Biology and Microbiology at the Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. He is an elected member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the National Academy of Medicine and a leading science communicator battling misinformation about COVID-19 and the vaccines. Thank you so much for joining me, Peter. Oh, thanks so much for having me, Dr. Pan. Good to hear from you again. Thank you, Dr. Otez. Now, 14 years ago, there was another coronavirus, SARS, that killed over 700 people in Asia. And your team developed the SARS vaccine. What happened? Yeah, so we've... Um... We've, uh, my, our group, uh, which is called the Texas Children's Center for Vaccine Development at Texas Children's and Baylor College of Medicine, has been taking on making poverty related neglected disease vaccines, vaccines that the big pharma companies don't, don't want to touch because they're only diseases of the poorest of the poor, mostly parasitic infections, which are complicated vaccine targets to begin with. And then, um, uh, about a decade ago, we got introduced to a group at the New York Blood Center that had solved a very important problem on coronavirus vaccines, and that some vaccine constructs, like using killed virus vaccines or virus vectored vaccines, actually made laboratory animals worse rather mm-hmm. than better. And so this, and this is a phenomenon known as immune enhancement, and they had worked their way through this, and I. And we were able to come up with a piece of the spike protein of the virus. Mm-hmm. You know, if you look at that, that cartoon of the virus you've seen, or everyone's seen it by now, it looks like a donut with a piece of RNA stuffed in the middle of it, and then you see those spikes mm-hmm. popping out all around. Well, that spike is what binds to the host receptor, and if you make an immune response to it, you can uh, uh, protect laboratory animals and hopefully ultimately people, but just by making a small piece of that, it made a vaccine that both protected and did not cause the immune enhancement problem. So we partnered with them, wrote an NIH grant that got funded and in collaboration with the U.S. Army, Walter Reed Army Institute of Research and the Galveston National Lab, we were able to make a pretty good vaccine. And uh, But then this was by 2016, we had made it. So we invested years of time and effort to, to do this supported by the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. And then we couldn't raise the money to, after that to move it into clinical trials. So it was, we really tried hard and were unable to do so. Uh, so we thought that was the end of it. Then when COVID-19 emerged out of Wuhan and at the end of 2019, and as we started seeing new information come out on BioArchive, a preprint server, uh, a lot of the Chinese scientists were putting up information about the virus, we realized it could potentially be repurposed. And and it's been off to the races since trying to uh, get our vaccine ready to go to move into clinical trials and raise the money for it. And since that's one is from the original SARS, which we would repurpose for COVID-19, we'll also do another one that's specific for COVID-19. Wow. So maybe a missed opportunity when you weren't able to get funding uh, prior Oh yeah, no question. I mean, because we would have by now, we would have had all of the safety data and and everything else, and you know, we would have been. Uh, this would have been. You know, everyone's talking about emergency use authorization. Maybe this would have been one of the first to go. But we we still can move pretty quickly if we can get some support uh, now to to move it forward. So we're putting together a team. We have put together a team to. Uh, start engaging the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, to file what's called an IND, an investigational new drug application. They'll review it, and if everything looks good, we might get the green light to go ahead and proceed to clinical trials. Okay. 
Now, um, why would a COVID-19 vaccine be so important uh, for our economy? People are out there saying, you know, suffering economically and getting life back to normal. What difference does the vaccine make? Well, the pro- the big problem that we're facing with COVID-19 is that there's so many people are without symptoms and they're walking around transmitting the virus. And that's been the real problem with this virus because it has sort of a Janus face, a two-face, two faces to it. On the one hand, some people are getting very sick and going into uh, intensive care units and getting hospitalized or even sudden deaths we're hearing about now. So we're still learning about this virus. Then another group that seems to handle it pretty well but still transmits it in the community. And when you have that situation where you've got a highly transmissible virus out there, the most straightforward way to control it would be by vaccinating the whole population uh, or the population at risk and then protecting them. And that's what solved it for, you know, you know better this better than anybody, Richard, since you've been on the front lines of the anti-vaccine movement, mm-hmm. uh, as, as I have. And we know we know that the only way to stop measles is another highly transmissible virus is to vaccinate the community or many other transmissible uh, diseases, and this is the same way. Now, we talked about the vaccine that you developed, and many experts are saying that a COVID-19 vaccine is at least 18 months away. You hear some people throwing out some different numbers. Um, what are the barriers to creating an effective vaccine? I mean, uh, some people are saying, well, we can get one by the summer, but um, is that realistic? Well, you know, there's a, unfortunately, there's a lot of hype out there being put out mm-hmm. by the biotechs and the um, uh, some of the pharma companies, even some other groups, you know, saying we can make a vaccine in a few weeks and this sort of stuff. And the truth is the technology is advanced to the point where often you can do that. The problem is this. You still have to show that the vaccine actually works in people, even if you know it works in animals. And some groups have animal data, others don't. And you have to show that it's safe. And it's really tough to accelerate those timelines. Um, And that's why vaccines typically take years, because that's the amount of time it takes to show that the vaccine both works and is safe. And, And it's hard to compress those too much. And and that's the big question of how much we can compress without compromising anything to do with safety or, or showing that it works. And we have, you know, a great group at the U.S. Food and Drug Administration around vaccines. There's a branch of the FDA called CBER, the Center for Biologics Evaluation Research, and they've really fine-tuned this. So they really know how to look for any safety flares or signals and know how to look for things that are working. And we've worked with them for years. They're a great group. And, you know, you don't want to mess with that too much um, and and pressure them in any way. So that's going to be the tension. People's, you know, uh, people who are eager and hungry to have a vaccine now versus what's realistic and what you can do without compromising uh, safety. So actually talking about safety, uh, actually there are even some people out there criticizing a vaccine that doesn't even exist about safety. Um, what What is necessary to be sure that the vaccine is safe? What are some of the things that we need to see happen uh, before the new vaccine comes out so that we feel comfortable that it's safe? Well, the first thing is you want to know that it doesn't do anything bad in laboratory animals. And there are several models of coronavirus infections, and we invested several years showing that we can deliver a vaccine that's that's safe and doesn't produce one of the known side effects that can occur in lab animals, which is called immune enhancement, where you get infiltrates of certain types of cells called the eosinophils uh, in the lungs or in the liver of vaccinated animals. So one, you want to show that you can control it in laboratory animals and prevent it from happening. And then you want to start showing that it's okay in people. And there's that, that's a several step process. The first thing you want to do is what's called a phase one trial to take uh, vol- uh, normal volunteers, oftentimes between the ages of 18 and 45 or 20 and 45 young adults, immunize them and make certain that nothing happens uh, untoward, whether it's a allergic reaction or pain in the arm or anything along those lines, and assuming that goes okay, which at that part usually does, Then you want to do that same, repeat that again in an area where there's ongoing transmission. 
And the reason is because you're going to want to know that when those people who got vaccinated uh, are are immunized, that you don't start seeing any evidence of immune enhancement in 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 those individuals. And uh, and figuring out how to look for that itself is is problematic because uh, you know does that mean we have to look for pulmonary infiltrates in the lungs of of the volunteers or monitor their liver function. So that that has to be worked out. And then you start doing bigger studies in different populations. That's what a phase two is all about. Uh, Also, you may want to look at specific populations because maybe the population you want to protect are older individuals or those with underlying diabetes or heart disease or uh, or young adults or maybe even adolescents and then doing expanded safety studies in that group. Ultimately, this will culminate in what's called a pivotal study, a phase three study, mm-hmm. which goes, which is released to licensure. This is a large, or much larger study, often with several thousand or tens of thousands of individuals that you want to sh- that you want to now have evidence that those who get the vaccine uh, are not getting the infection versus those who weren't vaccinated, and you also want to uh, know that that in that bigger study that you didn't start seeing a rare safety event that you might not have seen in the smaller studies. So, and, and all that takes time, typically years. So the, the hard part is figuring out how to compress those timelines. And so what we're looking at now are plans to figure out how to do this over a shorter period of time. And there's a few ways you can do that. One is you can test multiple different vaccines, each using a different technology, because you don't know Although we all know we know it's about interfering with with the the attachment of the spike protein to the receptor and inducing an immune response against the spike protein in some way, you want to know are there are different ways of doing it, whether it's just through RNA or DNA vaccines or vector virus vaccines or like ours recombinant protein vaccines. You want to know which one is the best and the safest, and the best way to do that is to get twenty thirty vaccines in the pipeline knowing that as many as 90% ultimately drop off um, and don't make it all the way through. And that at the end of the day, you might come up with two or three vaccines. Wow. So uh, that 18-month timeline is uh, one that, uh, well, it sounds like if everything goes right, we get one in 18 months, right? Well, the idea is we'd like to get two or three out there because they might have different indications. And the other thing to keep in mind, and not many people are aware of this, the first vaccine we get uh, that we start for general use is not necessarily the best vaccine. So we have a long history in America of getting different vaccines and then improving upon them. So, for instance, you know, we're both pediatricians. Mm -hmm. The HIV vaccine, the Haemophilus influenza type B, and You may remember during your residency training, that first vaccine was was not indicated for infants because it wasn't immunogenic. And then John Robbins and Raquel Schneerson figured out you take that capsule and you stick it onto protein and you get an immune response in infants, a much better vaccine. So the first vaccine license was not the one ultimately that we still use today. And and that's true of a lot of vaccines. It's been true of polio. I remember our first rotavirus vaccine had a safety problem, Mm -hmm. and then it got refined, and and we used different rotavirus vaccines after that. So there's every reason to believe the same thing might happen with COVID-19. Now, we develop a vaccine, but we right now have anti-vaccine extremists uh, protesting right now stay-at-home orders. We had them out here in uh, California and many other states. And they've also declared that they would refuse any COVID-19 vaccine. So once we have a vaccine, uh, well, we have a problem uh, in terms of uh, protecting the public. Uh, You have the same people who say they want to lift stay-at-home orders so the disease will spread, but also saying that they'll refuse uh, any sort of protection uh, against the virus as well. So what, what's, what are your thoughts about uh, this movement? Yeah, I, I was a bit surprised. I would have thought that with things looking so dire, first in China, then in Europe, and then in the U.S., and people clamoring for a vaccine, maybe the anti-vaccine groups would sort of disappear for a while. And, and they did for a small window of time and I had some peace and rest as you probably did but then they regrouped and came up with some 
uh, some new alliances, and they began aligning themselves with, um, I guess, libertarian. I don't know if we'll call them libertarian groups or, or groups that are, um, uh, you know, do- don't want any type of government interference. And so they they created this unholy alliance with those groups, and now they're saying they're not going to take a vaccine. Yeah, well, I think uh, many of investigators have seen that uh, this is actually a fairly small group. Uh, they seem to have been manipulated from some uh, small group of funders who are trying to make them look larger than they really are. But unfortunately, uh, it has influenced some political leaders as well. Now, you've been a communicator. Well, I, I think the um, I think the issue is um, that you want, you know, the fact that you've got some of the biotechs and pharma companies and even other groups sending out press releases they're going to have a vaccine by this fall. You know, they think that impresses people um, and certainly probably impresses their investors and shareholders, but it also creates a ripple with the anti-vaccine movement because it kind of plays in into the stuff they talk about. Uh, you know, they've always alleged that we don't test vaccines adequately for safety and and we both of us have spent a lot of time refuting that and explaining why we're so careful about timelines and take our time to ensure adequate safety and then these guys come along and send out these outrageous press releases it it creates a lot of problems and uh and now we've got to figure out how to walk that back and uh, and that's gonna that's gonna be an issue and i've been talking to colleagues uh uh, in the U.S. government and in academia and, and in other groups to figure out how we can explain this a bit more. So we, we need a much better communication strategy than we currently have. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. Uh, I know that when people ask me about vaccine, I tell them it's 18 months minimum. Uh, that's because it is about the safety and efficacy studies that have to be done. You just can't compress them very much, as you said. Uh, and, a- absolutely. And, you know, and I say it probably won't be 18. It could easily be two or three years. Mm-hmm. And then, um, but then, you know, this Oxford group comes along and they say, we're going to have it by the fall. I said, come on, guys, you know, this, this is not helping. Or, you know, the, or the, the biotechs are saying, you know, we're going to have it in weeks or some of the pharma companies. So, Right. Uh, they're being all a bit tone deaf to how powerful this anti-vaccine movement is and how aggressive they are. And it's not like it used to be. Uh, you know, we, it, both of us are victims of attack by the anti-vaccine movement, mm-hmm. and um, and we know how organized they are. We know uh, how well funded they are. We know how far they've infiltrated the internet and mm-hmm. social media and. Amazon sites and Facebook mm-hmm. sites. So this is going to be a this is going to be a problem unless we can get our arms around it now. Yeah. Now you authored a uh, a fairly personal book. Uh, it's about your daughter as well. Vaccines did not cause Rachel's autism. Uh, what prompted you to write this book? And are there lessons from this book? Uh, so it was written pre COVID uh, for us during the COVID nineteen pandemic. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I you know I wrote this book uh, in part because I saw all of the resist. You you inspired me, oh, Dr. Well, Pan, partly because I saw all of the resistance you were putting, getting you know, uh, uh, receiving over the legislation that you were putting in the California legislature. You were doing the right thing, and and you took the concept of no good deed goes unpunished to a new level. <laughs> Uh, and and I thought, well, here I am, a uh, vaccine scientist and pediatric scientist and the parent of an adult daughter with autism. Look, if I don't do this, who's going to do it? And um, and so we went ahead and did it. And I'm, I'm glad I did. Uh, it's a book that really does a deep dive explaining why there's no link between vaccines and autism and why there's no plausibility between links between vaccines and autism because autism begins in early fetal brain development. So it's both a science book and a very personal story. And and I've been writing about this a fair bit, you know, that you know part of the reason why anti-vaccine movements thrive is because scientists and pediatricians are too often silent. Uh, we don't we're not out there doing the public, the kind of public engagement that needs to be done. And that's why I always agree to do podcasts like this, because I think they serve a very important function. Uh, they give a face to doctors and scientists and 
and uh, otherwise we're totally invisible, and that creates a gap, a vacuum that allows uh, anti-science and anti-vaccine movements to flourish. Well, I appreciate you speaking out. Oftentimes people are afraid to speak out because of the vitriol and uh, the threats. Uh, we've had death threats around that. And so many people are like, why do I want to put up with this, right? Why I, I don't? Why should I speak out and get threatened? And so it's uh, always encouraging to have uh, people like yourself uh, saying that, you know what, I will not be silenced. I will not be silenced. Yeah. I need to share the truth with the people and so that people can make the right decisions to protect themselves. Um, yeah, and also what happens is... Um you know, we're both linked to academic health centers in one way or another. I'm my full time position is in an academic health center, and you know, it, it's taken an education process because a lot of academic medical centers don't like their docs and their scientists so out there, you know, getting attacked. Uh, it, you know, they worry about how the how that affects the reputation of the institution, uh, and so there's often often scientists and physicians, especially in academia, which is a lot of where the uh, the public engagement will come from, is 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 not encouraged. And so we, we've had to work to change that culture as well. Now, uh, the CDC director uh, has warned America that a second wave of COVID-19 may happen in the fall, coinciding with the next flu season. Uh, as we discussed, uh, we are not going to have a COVID-19 vaccine yet, at least not for mass distribution. Um, so we have COVID-19 and flu potentially happening at the same time. And maybe you can tell me what you think as a expert about the likelihood of that. So what should we do uh, to try to protect our communities and our families uh, in, in the fall? Well, at the, at the very least, uh, we have to f figure out a way to tell Americans to get their flu vaccine. Mm -hmm. And uh, and to count, and that's a big component of the anti-vaccine group. They try to uh, discredit the flu vaccine. They try to say it, it doesn't work or there's not a good match. And they, even in years where there's not a good match, they neglect to tell you that that flu vaccine could still save your life or prevent you from being hospitalized. So we're going to need a very aggressive flu vaccination campaign this fall to get everybody vaccinated, and including kids. Uh, so we, at least we can start taking flu off the table, because if we have to battle flu and uh, COVID-19 at the same time, that's going to be a problem. Or if the anti-vaccine lobby has their way and we start seeing measles return and we have to battle all three, that's going to even be a bigger problem and it's and it'll be absolutely undoable. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, this is going to be really important how we communicate the importance of vaccines as we move into the fall and winter. No, I appreciate that. I know that uh, with the stay-at-home orders, uh, actually, we've seen a fall in the number of people getting vaccines for their infants. Uh, and so we know we have some catch up to play there, but uh, yeah, so, yeah. So how are you? Do, how are you managing that? Well, I I, I think that we have to remind uh, families that uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that they get their children, bring their children in to get vaccinated. Call first to your pediatrician uh, to make arrangements. Uh, we do need pediatric practices as well uh, to. Uh, be able to deliver uh, these vaccines as well as well-child uh, visits uh, as well. So they can do some of that remotely, but some of that may need to be done in person as well. And hopefully as uh, we move forward and we are able to put more public health uh, parts in place, then uh, and we're starting to lift some of the stay-at-home orders, we can certainly prioritize having uh, families go and uh, get their checkups and, and, and vaccines. Uh, and yeah, I think it's going to be so it's going to be so important. Yeah. And then, of course, I think in the fall, we do have to think about what are some of the policy uh, steps we might take to get people to get their flu vaccine. Uh, because when you think about hospitalizations, uh, you're an expert in infectious disease. Uh, the flu may have a more severe effect on seniors, but it's also spread much more among uh, youth and uh, young people. And so uh, being sure that we actually get people vaccinated against the flu as a way to both slow down the spread of the flu, but also reduce hospitalizations. Because even if you get the flu, despite having the vaccine, you're less likely in the hospital if you've been vaccinated than if you weren't. Right, right. That's what I've been saying. So we got to get that word out. Exactly. Well, thank you so very much for joining me today uh, for this podcast. 
Uh, and I want to thank you for listening to this episode of Putting the Public into Health by Dr. Richard Pan. If you have any questions or ideas for a future podcast, please email them to senator.pan at senate.ca.gov. Please stay home as much as possible. Stay at least six feet away from others outside. Wash your hands frequently and try not to touch your face. Together, we are slowing the spread of the disease and saving lives. Thank you so much for listening.